Hello everybody and welcome to this talk on ADEPT, a socio-technical theory of continuous integration. I'm Omar, pleasure to meet you. On a high level, the theory captures the socio-technical aspects of the software engineering process. We wanted to figure out how humans were interacting with automation, in this case CI tools, and how these tools fit into their workflow. Because we were coming across interesting phenomena, we felt we needed a way to tie them all together and see how the continuous practice ecosystem functioned. So, we did several human-centric studies which eventually resulted in ADEPT. The theory itself is described in much more detail in the paper, so I'd like to use this presentation to instead elaborate a little more on why we felt we needed ADEPT in the first place and what we can do with it. We started out by examining the basic software development workflow. A developer writes code that addresses an issue, pushes it to a repository, tests it, packages it, and then it gets deployed to an end user. So where do continuous practices fit in? One of several continuous practices promotes the use of automation to increase development efficiency and provide rapid feedback. Automation is integrated into several steps of the process to test, package, and deploy software. The issue here is that only examining the automation provides a narrow view of the development process. Software development is still very much a human-centric endeavor. Humans still write the code and are required to make the decisions regarding which changes get approved at each step. And they operate within the bounds of defined practices. In this case, the remaining continuous practices. This makes it a socio-technical system. To try and understand how humans and automation interact with each other, we first decided to take a look at GitHub projects and how they were using continuous integration tools. We found that automation was mostly referred to as a tool for testing. Furthermore, the continuous practices that should be in place to maximize the utility of these tools were at best not verifiable, and at worst, they were never mentioned in the project contribution guidelines. So we decided to do two more in-depth studies at a couple of software development organizations. The first looked at how non-functional requirements were being treated in a continuous context, and the second took a much deeper look at the practices that constitute the continuous paradigm. From the first, we found that most NFRs were being delegated to, to the automation itself. Developers were relying on the tool to deal with issues such as scalability or robustness. In the second study, and this is where it gets really interesting, we came across several phenomena related to automation that directly affected humans, developers and non-developers alike. So we wanted to bring our findings from all three studies together. We wanted to try and make valid recommendations to the people who are kind enough to let us study how they worked. But we also didn't want to move directly from our observations to rules and guidelines, which Fitzgerald and Stoll referred to as a shortcut. So we started looking at existing work in the software engineering domain, as well as work related to continuous practices. Most literature on continuous practices focuses on the automation integrated into developer workflow. It's only recently that we started seeing some human-centric work that examines developer tool relationship. And this becomes an issue because, and this is something I briefly touched on before, software engineering is a socio-technical endeavor that includes systems, humans, and their environment as interconnected concepts. And when we started to examine socio-technical theories in software engineering, we found most were heavily skewed towards one or two aspects of this paradigm, but never all three. Those that tried to capture all three were too high level for our use case and usually try to interpret the entirety of software engineering as an activity. That being the case, we decided to pool our findings from our previous three studies and combine them into the ADEPT theory. This gave us the constructs and relationships you see before you now. Humans, automation, process, and the other constructs coalesce together to make sense of what we were seeing. Okay, so far we've been talking about how and why the ADEPT theory came to be but how well does it represent the phenomena we've observed? I'd like to share with you two of these phenomena as viewed through a depth size. Continuous practices exist because they help provide rapid feedback to developers on the quality of their work. So developers who followed continuous practices were making small, frequent changes to the code base. The problem here is that while that was happening, program managers on the other end were seeing a slew of small, unrelated changes that they were supposed to check. They lost the context around the changes because they couldn't map them back to their corresponding features. Eventually, 
they wound up using feature toggles to throttle the incoming barrage of changes into manageable, testable features. Another interesting phenomenon we observed was using automation scripts as a form of documentation. You see, developers would often refer to build and configuration scripts when they wanted to learn more about the details of the build and testing processes. They also directed newcomers to these artifacts as part of their onboarding process. This was interesting to observe because we had already seen something similar in our GitHub study, but it was now happening again in a different context. Okay, so by now you're probably asking yourselves, how do I use this? Adept at its core is an explanatory theory. It's not meant to be predictive, but it can be used to either interpret existing sociotechnical phenomena or explore more avenues of sociotechnical research. Let's say you want to reason about why you're seeing a particular phenomenon in your data. You can use adept to generate possible hypotheses. On the other hand, let's say you want to determine if a new avenue of research could have some unexpected impact. You can use adept to see how everything fits together. I'd like to give you two examples, one for each use case. As an interpretive example, a paper published in 2017 found GitHub projects that use Travis CI had trouble attracting new developers. They also found it harder to retain existing developers. Based on the data they examined, it wasn't clear why this was happening. If we take a look at how Adept frames these phenomena, we can generate a few reasons. It could be that the way automation was integrated into the workflow made the development process more restrictive, or it might be the way Travis CI is documented was not helpful to developers who wanted to understand why their builds were failing, or it could even be that developers had difficulty in interpreting the results they were seeing from the Travis CI interface. Each of these reasons can form a basis for a testable hypothesis. When it comes to exploring new research avenues, I'd like to refer to the previous talk in this session about introducing chatbots into the development process. Chatbots, as a form of automation, will impact developers. But is that all they will do? I don't know. If I use Adept to get the high-level view of how automation interacts with the rest of the system, I can reason about this a little better. Is the chatbot being introduced because the process will become more efficient? Or is it the other way around? Do developers want to restructure their process just because they want to use a chatbot? We've already come across automation as a form of documentation as well. How will a chatbot impact the way developers interpret the process? And as a conversational interface, how will developers interpret the chatbot's results? Will they be more inclined to take its results at face value because they tend to anthropomorphize it? How will it be configured? And what tasks will it take on? There's a lot here that we have yet to, to explore. And I don't know about you, but I'm really excited to find out the answers to these questions. So if there's one thing I'd like you to, to, to take away from this talk, it's that if we just focus on the tool, we may wind up missing out on other crucial aspects. There's a delicate balance between all four of these constructs that maximizes the benefit gained. And that benefit is almost always a function of the context within which we study these constructs. So we should try not to lose sight of the forest for the trees. Thank you. Looks like we are. Yes, we are. Welcome, everyone, to the Q&A for the paper entitled ADAPT, a social technical theory of continuous integration. Thank you, Omar, for the great presentation. It's my pleasure to chair this session. Both we are from University of Victoria. And I am going to wait for the questions. Um, if I actually get to see the chat, the, the questions coming. So we have a first question mm -hmm. from... Um, Nah, ADEPT sounds a great theoretical framework. However, how can developers adopt it without making mistakes? How do we know whether individual developers interpret ADEPT correctly? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. See, w when we sort of built ADEPT, it was sort of to, to try and group uh, the different interpretations of the continuous practices that we've seen uh, in our studies as they were uh, happening. Uh, so we try to make it as minimalistic as possible. 
Uh, and this is something that we try and stress throughout the paper, as well as the previous studies too, that uh, context is king in that sense that um, it's always subject to the developer's interpretation. So I wouldn't say there's a correct interpretation of ADEPT. It, it, it heavily depends on the context because you could have developers who prioritize rapid feedback, but you could also have developers who just want uh, a framework that automates the testing, but not necessarily care about the rest of the continuous practices. So it is heavily context dependent. Um, Alexandra makes a point, and I think it asks, he challenges us to reconsider, interpret what we know now about the chatbots through the lens of ADAPT. Can you comment a little bit more on that? That's, that's a pretty cool question. Huh. Uh, now, I'm fortunate enough to have, uh, to, uh, I was lucky enough to be in Chisel at the time where one of our uh, really cool students, uh, Carly, was working on a uh, very extensive taxonomy of chatbots. Uh, so, um, and one of the things we were sort of talking about was uh, how do you define a chatbot? And to me, I've always thought of, thought of it as a form of automation. So in that sense, because it automates a task or it interacts with the developer in an automated fashion, so in that sense, it does fit into ADEPT. Um, and again, uh, everything that would essentially apply to, shall we say, continuous integration tools w in within the confines of the ADEPT theory would probably also apply to a chatbot. So in terms of configuration, in terms of uh, developers interpreting it, in terms of whether the chatbot itself could act as a form of documentation. So I, I think what I'm trying to get at is uh, ADEPT generates questions about the form of automation you're using. And what we're doing right now is actually trying to figure out uh, the extent of ADEPT's utility. Uh, it's still a work in progress, so, uh, but as soon as we have something concrete, we'll share it. And I guess your theory also, uh, the propositions that you provide uh, mm -hmm. could be used in future studies uh, to explain further contexts or in, get more insights about chatbots as automation yes. in CI. Yeah. 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 Uh, any other questions uh, from the audience? I'm going to wait. We have 55 seconds left. Uh, if not, I can ask a quick question, which is which does not have a long, a quick answer. But can you tell us a little bit more from your data analysis, Omar? You've mm -hmm. looked at so much. Uh, you've, you've, ha you've had a further study, uh, a few studies that you worked through. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, uh, and there's not much in the paper, so just give us the brief procedures or challenges or any insights? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I think the, the, the primary thing that I'd like to stress within the 20 seconds that I have left is that, uh, again, uh, it's all about context. What uh, one team considers to be a, the reason to, to adopt a CI tool, it would be a completely different reason for a different team. And that is what drives the practices that are built around the tool and how they Three use Three seconds it. left, yeah. yeah.